shell. Obviously, you know what this stuff was all about, right? It's not a surprise that we showed up tonight. Almost overnight, she went from a possible witness to a person of interest in the case of a missing mom of five from New Canaan. We see state police, New Canaan police, searching downtown Hartford. So what's that about? Why is the scene moved to Hartford? You need to tell us what you know about Jennifer's murder and Forrest Lewis. The girlfriend in the middle of a bitter and brutal divorce battle. Stuff you were throwing out, we have. And it's all Jennifer, it belongs to Jennifer. Do you understand? Turned high profile murder investigation. Guys, what happened to Jennifer Michelle? You gonna do the right thing, Michelle? We're taking you inside the trial of Michelle Traconis. And thanks for joining us once again for Inside the Trial of Michelle Traconis. I'm Shannon Miller. We are entering day six of testimony. We want to give you a live look from our camera outside Stanford Superior Court. It's set there to get underway around 1015 this morning. A little later on in the show, we're going to talk to one of our expert analysts on the case, Brian Foley, who was working with state police at the time. We will ask him about where this testimony is expected to lead. Albany Avenue in Hartford, where police allege Michelle Draconis helped Fotis Dulos cover up Jennifer's murder by dumping trash bags of evidence connected to Jennifer in that area. We'll get to that in just a few moments. But first, back on the witness stand today will be Kristen Maydell from the State Forensic Lab. She's a forensic science examiner in the DNA unit who worked on the Jennifer Dulos case. She spoke about whose DNA was tested and what was found from those samples taken from Jennifer Wells Lane home. I want to bring in my colleague Kevin Geis once again, who has been in the courtroom and following this trial every step of the way. Kevin, what did we learn during Chris and Maydale's testimony yesterday? Yeah, Shannon, well, the 20-year veteran of the state forensic laboratory was able to break down some of the results of some of the DNA. Maydell testified that swabs collected from a faucet and the mudroom doorknob of Jennifer's New Canaan home were consistent with Fotis Dulos' DNA profile. Assuming two contributors, the DNA profile from item 5S1 is at least 4.3 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from Fotis Dulos and one unknown individual than if it originated from two unknown individuals. Michelle Traconis is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from item 5S1. The forensics lab deals in probability. So how likely a DNA profile from evidence matches DNA taken from individuals versus someone random. Shannon. Now, Kevin, I want to take you back in time uh, just a bit to June of 2019. This was just days after Fotis Dulos' first arrest. Watch Fotis' reaction right here as then state's attorney Richard Colangelo introduced this new evidence. The lab was able to confirm that the defendant's DNA was found in a mixture on the faucet inside of Jennifer's kitchen, in the house where she uh, went missing from. So mixture, defense DNA, victim's blood on the faucet in her kitchen. Now you can see Fotis's gaze shift as he is learning for the first time that his DNA was found in Jennifer's home. Now the DNA found inside that Wells Lane home is consistent with Fotis Dulos. It's significant for the prosecution. According to an arrest warrant and testimony by the family nanny, Fotis knew he was not supposed to come onto Jennifer's property without a court ordered supervisor and Jennifer was strict about that. The nanny testified that on May 22nd, just two days before Jennifer went missing, something unusual happened ahead of a planned supervised visit. And you mentioned there was a visitation that day. Who had visitation? Uh, photos had visitation. And what time would um, photos arrive for visitation? Uh, Four thirty. And what time did he arrive on this day? This day he arrived at four. Was this unusual? Unbelievably unusual. Fotis was notoriously late to everything, including supervised visitation. Did you see him arrive at the house? I didn't see him arrive at the house until Jennifer noticed him through the window 
because he pulled in up the driveway and part of their agreement was that he had to wait at the bottom of the driveway for the supervisor to arrive and then together they would drive up the driveway and get the kids for the supervised visit. So it was strange that he drove his car all the way up the driveway with nobody noticing. Um, so Jennifer saw that he came, came down and got me and said, I'm, she just said, I'm gonna go talk to him and see what's going on. And he said he was confused. And so he just went back down the driveway and waited for the supervisor to arrive. Now, again, according to the arrest warrant for Michelle Traconis, Fotis Dulos was aware he was not to come onto the property on Wells Lane before the arrival of that third party observer or his designee. Lauren Almeida said she then left the house because she didn't want to be around Fotis. She avoided contact with him after a previous argument. Almeida testified that Jennifer allowed Fotis to have dinner that night on the back patio with the children, but with a lot of precautions. Lauren Almeida said that she then left the home because, again, she did not want to be around Fotis Dulos again after that previous argument. So, again, we learn more about the precautions that she and Jennifer took to make sure that the kids were safe. Did you and Jennifer do anything to prepare for Mr. Dulos' visit? Yes. What did you do? We locked all the doors. Why did you lock the doors? Because she did not want him entering the house at all. In, in their living room at 69 Wells, it was all opened windows with um, doors, and so you could enter. And so we made sure all of those, including the mudroom door, was all locked. And after you assisted her in locking the doors, what did you do next? She, um, we were preparing the food that was going to be eaten on the patio. That way they didn't need anything coming in. So they had all the cups, utensils, napkins, plates, everything was out there on the patio. The food as well, or that came later? No, the food as well, because he came with the food and gave it to Jennifer. And so she had it in the fridge. So we just put it out. So, Kevin, the prosecution here is really emphasizing that Jennifer did not allow Fotis inside the home. Fotis knew that. So his DNA should not be inside the home anywhere, right? Right, absolutely. So that was something the prosecutors were definitely trying to get across to the jury through this uh, forensics testimony, essentially saying that his DNA was not supposed to be there. It shouldn't have been anywhere near it. But yet when they tested everything, it came back as more than likely that Fotis Dulos's DNA was were in a couple spots within the home, not just on the outside, not just in the garage, but inside the home as well. Kevin, let's talk now about the mudroom door. We heard the retired state police sergeant talk about seizing the doorknob and also preserving a fingerprint on it. He also took swabs of those knobs and got sent to the state forensics lab. One of them was consistent with Fotis Dulos's DNA profile. Assuming three contributors were the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the toothbrush is one of the contributors, the DNA profile from item four, 1S3 is at least 900,000 times more likely to occur if it originated from Fotis Dulos, the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush, and one known, unknown individual than if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and two unknown individuals. So then, one by one, the prosecutor, Sean McGinnis, then asked Maydale about swabs taken from the blood-like stains in the garage, the Range Rover, and the garbage cans. She testified that they were consistent with Jennifer's DNA. So, Kevin, the testimony from the state forensics lab is very critical, but it's also very complicated. DNA doesn't deal with absolutes. The judge even asked some questions to try to make it easier for the jury to understand. Got to ask you, what's their engagement been like through all this very technical testimony? Yeah, absolutely. So we know the jurors were definitely uh, trying to stay engaged, trying to focus, but it is complicated. There were multiple times that the judge had to ask questions. Prosecutors had to clarify things. You had multiple different moments throughout the testimony where uh, there were definitely moments where jurors had a lot of questions about what was going on. And of course, the prosecutors hoped that by the time the testimony was over, those jurors' questions were answered. It, it is the best science available, but DNA isn't always a slam dunk for the jury. Uh, we'll, of course, have to see how all of this plays out. Kevin, 
Thanks for the latest. And we first showed you again this photo from inside the home earlier this week. This is Jennifer's toothbrush in the master bedroom. Investigators seized the toothbrush and sent it to the forensics lab so they would have her DNA profile. So here are the DNA profiles that the lab used to compare to samples taken at the scene. They were able to get Jennifer's DNA profile again through that toothbrush. Fotis Dulos and Michelle Draconis were served search and seizure warrants on May 31st, 2019 to obtain DNA samples fingerprints and full body photo photographs. Uh, they also had DNA for the five Dulos children because they lived inside that home. The nanny Lauren Almeida also submitted her DNA as did Pavel Gamini, an employee of Fotis Dulos who was expected to be a key witness in this case. Now his DNA was not found at the scene nor was Michelle Draconis's. Who that forensic specialist from the state lab did testify to some of the evidence that was inconclusive. She could not rule Draconis out. There is no place in New Canaan or in that suburban that has Michelle Draconis's DNA. And I'll emphasize the um, this testing they can do can find as little as three cells. Now, Kevin, Michelle's attorney telling you outside of the courthouse yesterday uh, that, but I want to talk for a minute about uh, Pavel Gamene. So uh, the jury may be wondering, you know, exactly uh, why were investigators interested in his DNA profile and what do we expect to hear about his connection to the case? Right, so Pavel's come up a couple times now in a few different points of testimony, and we are expecting to hear more about him as this case progresses. But investigators at the time believed that it was Fotis Dulos who borrowed Pavel's truck to actually commit the crime down in New Canaan. So they wanted his DNA profile throughout the investigation. So he's continuing to come up, but we are expecting to hear more from him as we continue through this case that uh, Pavel Gamene was compliant with state police. He is the one who Fotis Dulos told him to keep those seats in that Tacoma pickup truck. He thought that was a little suspicious. Uh, he ended up holding on to those seats because Fotis Dulos wanted him to replace them. Pavel Gamene, again, not following Fotis Dulos' instructions to get rid of the seats, he held on to them, later gave them over to state police and also let state police search his home. Um, obviously someone who was cooperating with investigators throughout this case. We did learn in the suppression hearings, Kevin, that Pavel Gumini was granted immunity in, in all of this, uh, in his statements that he gave to state police. Uh, we will hear again much more about uh, Pavel Gumini throughout all of this. He is listed on both the state's uh, witness list as well as Michelle Dracotis' uh, defense attorney's list of persons of interest in this case. That'll certainly be impactful testimony we look forward to hearing more on. Much more to come on Inside the Trial of Michelle Traconis. Coming up, I'll sit down with a former spokesperson for the state police commissioner, Brian Foley, about those early days of the investigation and one of the breakthrough moments where this trial is expected to go next. To inside the trial of Michelle Traconis, I'm joined once again by Brian Foley, the former spokesperson for the Connecticut Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection. Uh, you were first with me down in Stanford last week, Brian, for the first day of the trial. We so appreciate you being back with us. You have such important and crucial insight uh, into all of this. And, and so many times, again, you and I were, I would call you in the middle of the night yep. and ask you, Brian, I've heard, you know, some developments. What can you tell me? This was as it was for the media, a living Living, breathing, ever evolving case. Um, so I want to go back to just when all of this was happening. Uh, you were the one that was fielding all the questions from media, both local uh, in the Northeast region, in the country. I'm sure you got some international calls for answers on this. Can you talk about in those early days the demand from the public, the media, um, about details on this uh, just in those early days that Jennifer went missing? Um, well, so it's so difficult. Uh, there's so much to balance. There's so much going on that the public doesn't see, so much behind the scenes. Evidence is starting to uh, be discovered. The investigation, ep investigative efforts are ramping up, and we understand the public wants to know. They want all these answers. You want these answers. 
and we think that's important, but most importantly, the family wants the answers sure. too, and how much can you give them? And as a detective, uh, as a former homicide detective, I can tell you it's so hard not to tell the family because we know yeah. if media is hounding us, they're also hounding the family, friends, everything they can find out. That's your job. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we have to be careful. Releasing too much information can certainly be uh, dangerous in that we could lose evidence. If mm -hmm. we start talking, hey, we're heading over here this morning, someone get there in front of us and take evidence in theory. Yeah. So we have to be super careful. We understand that, that the defense is watching everything, that everyone's watching it. And you know, for this trial to now be coming along mm -hmm. and for everyone to see some of this information and, uh, and some of the things that were going on behind yeah. the scenes, um, it's rewarding in that it builds confidence. Sure. And so much of this, you know, when, when we did talk to, me, to media during, during the investigation, we wanted people to have confidence in us, in, in the state of Connecticut, in the Connecticut State Police, in our investigative efforts, in law enforcement in general, that if, you commit, if, you, if there's a murder committed, they're going to find out who did it. And by not saying anything, people start to lose confidence. So we tried to balance that yeah. and put out, you know, there's ways I can talk to media and not say too much sure. and, and still build confidence uh, in the state police. So this is rewarding mm -hmm. for detectives, for the information to come out now and so that people, people can see and rewarding for the, the command staff to, for people to see, look at all the stuff we're doing, yeah. look how competent our investigation was, but only rewarding to a certain step Mm -hmm. the, uh, the reward comes in a conviction, and that's all there is to it. And at this time, uh, as you were fueling all of those questions from the media, all we, the public, really knew there were these missing flyers for Jennifer Dulos. Yep. Her face was up everywhere. Uh, we would see, you know, uh, groups of people holding vigils for her. Um, it, it, so there really was this kind of mystery that was there. And at the time now, we're learning there was a ton of police work going on behind the scenes. Uh, there yep. was blood that was found in the, in the home that you guys not only had collected, had already done some fast track work yep. to get to the forensics lab. So again, those details we don't always get to know. And as you mentioned, there's important reason for that because this is the initial stage of the investigation and you cannot have anything compromised. Um, I want to talk about just the heightened uh, investigation when it became, you know, realized that there was, you know, it went from a missing persons call to blood found in the home. Um, Jennifer's abandoned SUV. Yep. How bad does this seem to investigators? You know, so let's start from the cops initially on the scene. Mm -hmm. You kind of get there and you know you already have a missing person, so you're kind of suspicious right, uh, right from the get-go as to what exactly happened. Is this really a missing person? Mm -hmm. As soon as blood evidence starts to, to rear its head, yeah. as a cop, you now have to escalate. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean you call for a supervisor. You call for detectives. And, and with a police department like New Canaan, while they're, they're great investigators and a great police department, it starts to outgrow them. And then they make notification to the state's attorney's office, who then calls the state police the major crimes van, because you know, you really want the best. And I will put the detectives on that major crimes van uh, in, in the Connecticut mm -hmm. State Police up against anyone in the country yeah. as to how professional and how good they are at getting evidence. So basically what it is, is it's more resources mm -hmm. and getting the more resources in there, getting them there as soon as possible. The sooner you can hand off a, a homicide investigation to an experienced homicide detective, the better the chances are of solvability. And, and the same goes for crime scene detectives. When mm -hmm. that major crime scene van comes up, they are surgical in their approach. And then we also had, we, we, the benefit with the state is we also uh, oversaw the state lab. And Doc mm. Valero, who you know well, yep. uh, he put priority on this case and on the DNA. So when DNA evidence came, yeah. it came fast. And let's talk about how it came because it was the day after Jennifer went missing that New Canaan police said, hey, Fotis, can you come down here? We, you know, we'd like to talk for you a little bit. Yep. And it's during that time that uh, Fotis hands over his phone after those investigators asked to look at it. Yep. They let him know it's now in their possession. Yep. Um, talk about that switch from Fotis handing over his phone to doing that forensics on the phone to finding the location. Um, this takes a major turn in the investigation. So can you talk about that point that day after Jennifer went missing? So people are saying, you know, oh, he should have never handed over the phone and, you know, the cops maybe shouldn't have searched the phone at that point. So let me kind of get through that yeah. a little bit. One, he shouldn't have handed over the phone. Let's talk about that. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. The cops would have gotten what they needed to get uh, through a search warrant through the, the cellular phone companies sure. they would very easily find out where uh, what his cell phone uh, number was what company had that number and then a search warrant to the company basically when they when they seize that phone they're saying 
hey, it's pretty reasonable to think that this phone may contain evidence to the crime, but mm -hmm. they're just seizing it. Yep. They're not searching the phone at that point. The phone goes in a, in a they, it goes into a box or a bag that cannot, no one can access the phone. So like no, no cellular signals can be sent into the phone, no Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, nothing can get into that phone. So nothing can be altered and it's seized. Uh, they're very careful about that uh, and how they, they search it. And then they bring it into a, a special room where it's searched. Again, the same thing. Uh, but they're not going to search that phone until a judge says you can search that phone. And that's mm -hmm. done through a search warrant. So, but they would have gotten that evidence anyways. But yeah. of course, now once they get that GPS evidence and now they put it on a map and, and as they do it, they actually map out, you know, where, where the GPS, the, the pings are on the yep. phone. Uh, and then it, then it comes to Hartford uh, and things certainly escalated from there. And that's one of the, the key moments in this case where things really start to turn. We learned that Votus Dulos was found along Albany Avenue in Hartford the yep. night that Jennifer went missing around the same time that state police, oddly enough, yep. had come to Jennifer's ho uh, home at the first time. Um, again, the... This is the scene here, as you remember that uh, really uh, just I, moment. I there. Yes, that's <laughs> um, and, all, and have. <laughs> all of this kind of culminated after state police went in, um, kind of walked along Albany Avenue, looked at surveillance video from businesses. Yep. Then we said, "Look, let's tap into the C4 video here." And boy, what did you find? Uh, so, so that was great. So, so what, what I think, what really. And I would love to have seen Fotis's face when he first found out that we had video, not just there on Albany Avenue into the, the, the public garbage cans, but also the, the residential garbage cans as well, I believe, on Green Street. Yeah, there, uh, there's a picture of one there now. I'd have loved to have seen his uh, face when that came along. But mm -hmm. obviously, I think this is what ties Traconis in, because this is where her, her DNA evidence first appears, mm -hmm. is in the evidence found in the Hartford neighborhoods. Uh, the, the, the troopers had already done a great job in pinging the phone and going to area businesses and, and finding video and uh, doing all the things they need to do to canvas the area. But now the C4 video actually has is, you know, Steven Spielberg couldn't have filmed it better. It actually and not only is her DNA evidence there, we also get her there on the scene as mm -hmm. well. Her cell phone? Uh, no, there. you can actually see a female yep. in the truck at that time, and then you match it with the cell phone, and, yeah. and so that puts her on there. Then you got the DNA on the duct tape, DNA on the bag. Yeah. Um, it, it's going to be a, a tough case for her to outrun here, outrun the evidence, and, right. and for detectives, uh, everyone that works together. And this is what you kind of see when you mm -hmm. have New Canaan, Farmington, uh, Hartford, State Police, everyone working together. Everyone understands the exigency. Everyone understands the timing of it. And I tell you, the, the, the odd thing is... It was a holiday weekend in mm -hmm. Hartford. Yep. And because of that, the trash collection got staggered a day yeah. off. And it, it helped the state police yeah. when they all went, when, when, when after they get all the video and everything to go down there, uh, it saved a lot of evidence because yeah. of the holiday weekend and DPW in Hartford staggers off a day of the trash collection. And yet Michelle Traconis maintains she did not know what was in those trash bags and she didn't know what Fotis was doing at the time. I expect to hear more testimony on that coming up. And more inside the trial of Michelle Traconis next. We will talk more with Brian Foley about the investigation and the twists and turns that he was all a part of. Welcome back to Inside the Trial of Michelle Draconis. I am joined once again by Brian Foley, the former spokesperson for the state police commissioner. Uh, I just cannot imagine uh, all of the communication that was going on at this point in, in the investigation. Investigators were really burning the midnight oil to get more answers in this. Let's go from Albany Avenue when investigators descended on that area to try to find whatever they could. A couple days later, uh, state police asked Fotis Dulos and Michelle Draconis if they would be uh, able, through a search and seizure warrant, um, to give over some fingerprints, to give over a cheek swab, uh, full body photographs. Yep. Talk about that moment and then that switch for those uh, forensics lab to turn that DNA over quickly. So, it, well, that comes down to, again, uh, good crime scene work, finding mm -hmm. that fingerprint on the faucet. Yeah. But so now, so crime scene detectives find a fingerprint in the faucet. They put it in the APHIS system, which is basically the system that tells you who the fingerprint is. 
But a lot of times, nothing comes back. And if nothing comes back, let's say you've never been arrested, your fingerprints aren't in the system mm -hmm. there. Uh, so now they have to find a fingerprint. They obviously have uh, reason to believe that it could be a lot of people, uh, Fotis Dulos being one of them. So they apply for a search and seizure warrant to get the, the DNA, to get the fingerprints. This is very common, mm -hmm. uh, by the way, in these types of investigations. They come down and they swab you, uh, and then you give your fingerprints. But I mean, at that point, if you're guilty of a murder, you have to know it's coming down now and that they have evidence and they're able to, as you talked about earlier in, uh, in the in show, the other people's evidence, they're able to eliminate them. Mm -hmm. So now we have a, an unknown DNA sample when we need a match and now we're looking for that match. Obviously, these are good places to start with uh, photos and Michelle. Yeah. They get it to the lab. And as you know, the lab was uh, pushing these things pretty quick because, and the reason is with these types of investigations, you know, you don't want to say one case is getting more attention than the other or anyone's getting any, any speedier, but in, in the expediency of these cases, you have to get through them pretty quick mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah, and there was a missing mom of five children, and uh, that turnaround happened really quick with the forensics lab. It was a DNA match with Fotis Dulos, and hours later, that arrest came for both of them. Brian Foley, thank you so much for being with right. us again. Incredible perspective and insight into this. That wraps up our exclusive Inside the Trial, Michelle Tricona's streaming special. You can watch the trial live on our streaming channels when it starts around 10.15 this morning. We'll have live coverage on NBC Connecticut starting at news at 4. Be sure to join us weekdays at 9 a.m. for more in-depth analysis of the trial as it continues to unfold. Thanks for watching.